blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. If there's anyone that is for you, I don't know anyone that's more for you than moms. I'm going to tell you, my mom, she is for me. My mom was always for me. If there's anyone that believes in you, there's probably not anyone that believes in us any more than our moms. Now, we had the opportunity, you were able to see Megan Nunn if you came in early, our 15 minutes before we get started. Megan was given a testimony about her son, Branson. Uh, technically, Branson was born with about two and a half chambers of his heart instead of the four chambers that, that we're supposed to have. And she's been in quarantine for days and days and days at the Ronald McDonald House. But the wonderful testimony is that Branson is doing miraculously, miraculously well. He's over 10 pounds now. They let him out of the hospital. He's waiting uh, one more surgery. But I'm going to tell you, it's just been a miracle what has happened in little baby Branson. And Branson's a fighter. But I'm going to tell you, his mama is a prayer. His daddy is a prayer. I'm going to tell you, I got the opportunity to marry them right here just a couple months ago. It is such a blessing. Such a blessing. Talk about another family. Looking down there, Joe and Angela got engaged. They're getting married. Got their whole family there on the second row. I'm going to tell you, God wants to bless your home. God wants to bless your family. But you know, a lot of times those blessings come through a mother's prayers. How many realize a lot of times, I'm going to tell you, it's just like moms. I don't know what it is, but moms like to pray. I'm not saying dads, we don't like to pray. I'm just saying moms may be a little bit better at it. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there were many a night and times that I would wake up and I'd hear my mama praying. That's the kind of house I grew up in. That's the way, the way my home was like. And, and I know my mom believed in me and moms will believe in you and, and hope for the very best. And I hope that you had a mom like that uh, and is a mother like that. I can say that without question, without doubt. Anne is an incredible mother. Anne loves her babies. She loves, I and mean, the babies, how many, not trying to put our children down, but no matter how old you get, you're still a baby. All of the mamas are all saying, amen, that's right, that's right. You're not going to ever get, and one of these days you'll have your own and you'll understand that. And so it's not being critical of, of children. Uh, my children are grown, thank God. They moved out of the house. Thank God, even again, even better, amen, amen, amen. And so, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to raise them. We raise them so that they can get out of the house, so that they can face the struggles, the adventures, and the joys that God's going to provide for them. And I thank God for Anne because she's a great mom and because she also, she cares for the church in the exact same way. She's a mother. She has a mother's heart. And there's something special about having a mother's heart. Because even sometimes when we're wrong. Now I didn't say mothers didn't correct us. But even sometimes when we are wrong. Mamas still love us. Amen. I don't know if you've ever said this to your children. We always tried to use this. that We're not mad at you. We don't like what you did. But we love you. Moms are great at correction. Moms are great at loving. Moms are great at encouraging. And there's a guy in the Bible who he made some mistakes. He had some problems along the way. As a matter of fact, he made some horrible mistakes. Is there anybody out there, my hand will go up first, that's ever made a horrible mistake? Uh, probably almost all of us. If you haven't, you're just not old enough yet. You will later, eventually. But you know what? This guy, he learned and he learned how to love. He learned how to be a lover. And, and I want to learn from him because I've failed before. And this man may have more on this subject than any other person other than Jesus as far as understanding failure. You know, sometimes when you appear or feel like you're failing, it's not over. You're just, you know, you're working through things. How many of you know God's going to work you through some things? But he's never going to leave you. Amen. How many of you know moms? They, they might work with you and they might work you through some stuff, but they're never going to leave. They're never, ever, ever going to leave. I have one other friend who has taught me so much on this, and, and many of you know who he is, Parfait, my friend from Rwanda. You know, we planned on going to Rwanda in June and being in the prisons and traveling through the country and doing ministry. Parfait is famous over in Rwanda because Parfait is the first person that went back into the prisons and started praying for and loving on the people that killed all of his family members. 
His mama is alive, and that was by a miracle. One brother is alive because he was out of the country. Parfait was here at the University of Indiana getting school. He was working on a master's degree in mathematics for the nation of Rwanda when the genocide took place. I tell you what, to travel with him and to go into those prisons, he actually knows the men that killed his family. Now, it's a lot of different men, but to see the grace in this guy, to see the love in this guy. How many of you believe we can learn from people like that? I think we can. Well, there's another man like that in Scripture. His name is Peter. And he wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. He said, And above all things, have fervent charity or fervent love among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. You know, I want to be like that. That's what I want. I want to be like that. I want to be a, a lover, a giver. I've got a dear, dear friend. As a matter of fact, I've said his name. Probably every one of you, almost all of you would know this guy. But he mentioned this the other day. We've, I've been in so many Zoom meetings. How many of y'all know what Zoom is? Get on there and you meet with different people. I thank God for, you know, meeting with the lieutenant governor. This week I met with the, the attorney general of Texas. Uh, I've had many, many Zoom meetings with pastors and different people, but he said this in one of our Zoom meetings, one of my friends, he said, you know, in our church, he said, uh, nobody argues over race. How many, you know, some churches, they're still, you know, they're white churches, black churches, brown churches. We're, we won't be every color of church. He said, nobody here will argue over that. Nobody will argue over homosexuality. But he said, when it comes to COVID, people want to argue. How many of you realize that we're in the midst of a little bit of a storm? How, we're just, you want to call it whatever, it's, it's, it's kind of like a little bit of a storm. But Peter said this, he said, above all things, I want to have fervent charity among ourselves, among yourselves, charity that overcomes, charity that covers a multitude of sins. And you know what I've determined is that one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be an encourager. I am always positive. I don't know if y'all notice this. I'm positive to the point that being so positive might make people mad. I don't know. I picked up a couple of trolls on Facebook this week. I said, man, I've done something right. Finally, I got people that hate me on Facebook. For what? For loving people. Just for loving and encouraging and always encouraging. But, but you know what? I've learned you can't make everybody happy. You don't try to make the devil happy. You'll never make him happy. But you know what? God has a word for us, and it's a word of what? encouragement it's a word of what love it's a word where he gave his life and he poured his life the scripture here says to to have fervent charity or fervent love well i looked this up in the greek and i'm going to give you another instance here where it's used it means to love until you are strained man have you ever loved until you're man i tell you what i just love so much i'm hurting i just love so much my heart hurts it's used also in this tense. It's used of an athlete that strains to win a race. An athlete that strains to win the race. How I many of you, when you run that race, you know, especially when you're in the finals, you give it everything that you've got. You strain. You, you lay it all out there. You give it all on the track. You leave it all on the field. You don't come back and like, well, you know, I could have ran a little bit faster. No, you, you give it all. He said fervent love, the love that strains, the love that covers. That word in, in, in Greek for covers hides a multitude of sins. It's not a blind love, but it's an incredible love. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up strives, but love covers all sins. Hatred stirs strife up, love covers all sins. That's the kind of person mothers are. Do you realize that? That's the way mothers are. Mothers want to cover you. They don't want to stir up strife. They want to love you. They want to bless you. And I think that's a tremendous gift because when your sins are covered, there is peace, just like a mom. There's peace. When your sins are covered, there's peace. You know, God wants us to have peace. I remember coming home one time. I remember coming home and I was covered with mud from the top of my head to the bottoms of my feet. I was so nasty and so dirty. I knew I was going to spanking when I get home. I already knew that. I'm well, you're going to get a spanking. So after I fell in the mud and already got dirty, I said, what difference does it make now? 
I'm getting a spank and I might as well. It's probably not going to be any worse. So when I got home, I was covered from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I thought, how am I going to present myself to my mother? I'm going to be in trouble. And so this is what I did is, you know, as kids, how many of you, you know, you go to the back door and you just come right in the house. But did did y'all ever use a front door? I I don't even know if we hardly ever even opened our front door. Not, nobody came to the front door. Of course, the front door was the closest to the road, but everybody pulled in the little drive, and there was our, our back door about this far from the drive, two steps up. I thought, I'm going to the front door. She won't know who it is. And so I rang the doorbell, and my mom came to the front door, and she saw me, and when she saw me, she just started laughing. She just started laughing. Guess what? I didn't even get a spanking. She couldn't believe that I came to the front door. And I'm like, Mama, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But you know what? Her love and her laughter covered a multitude of mud. Amen? I was covered from from head to toe. And she loved me. She loved me through that. And she was a, a tremendous mom in so many different ways. I hope your mom is like that. I trust that she is because my mom... She had a lot of hardness in her own life. My mom was passed around when she was young. She was kind of unwanted. She lived in a group home. She was cared for, but I don't know how much she totally felt loved because she moved from place to place, from home to home, from relative to relative. I said she stayed in a group home. She didn't really have the love of her mother. She had her mother's time when her mom wasn't busy doing politics, when her mom wasn't busy going to high-class parties. But I don't know that she ever really felt loved. I want you to feel loved today. I want you to understand that God loves you in a very, very special way. And because my mom had a hard life growing up, There's not anything she wanted more to give to her kids than to give them love, to make us feel safe. And she may not have always felt cared for. She may not have always felt loved. Maybe she didn't always feel that. But I want you to know, my dad is taking the best care of my mother that you could ever imagine. My mom has Parkinson's. We pray for my mom. Please pray for her. Ann and I went down and saw her. We only saw her one other time during COVID, and it was like from here to the, to the camera because of COVID. We didn't want to get too close to her, just trying to use wisdom. We came down, and we hugged her, and we visited her this week, gave her Mother's Day. I cooked cookies for her. We brought gifts. We brought food. Food speaks to my mom. <laughs> she doesn't eat much. She eats like a bird, but she enjoys what she eats. And you know what, just the presence, just to understand, just to know that my mom, she always wanted to be protected, she wanted to be loved, she wanted to be nourished, she wanted to feel safe, but she always made me feel all of those things. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. I just want you to know my mom is a peacemaker. My mom was always a peacemaker in my life. My mom was always trying to make peace. And I think this is so powerful because mothers are probably the very best peacemakers I know of. They always want to keep peace in the family. They want to make peace. They want to go and make a way, even if there seemed to be no way. They want to make that peace. And here in this same passage, children is also referred to. The children of God. Those that are peacemakers, they're the children. They're to be called the children of God. And we certainly know that God invites all of us to be the children of the Lord. If he invites us to be the children of the Lord, he most certainly also invites every one of us to be a peacemaker. God wants you to be a child of his. He wants you to be a peacemaker. There could be no question of that. One of the names of Jesus, he's called the Prince of peace now of course i've used the word peace last sunday we talked about peace the greek word irene which is used a 111 times in scripture it's translated peace and all of those times and it means to bring two things together like a bone that is broken when a broken bone is put together 
and it heals that's called Irene but the two bones I used the illustration of my own shoulder I was three months and no healing and when they finally operated on me put two plates took marrow out of my my femur took my knee apart drilled up in there to get the good stuff the reconciliation stuff remember when Jesus came he was the good stuff he came to pay for you the doctor said we can take a piece of your hip but it's not as good I said I don't want no hip bone man I want the good stuff he said well the good stuff's found in your femur I said I want it that's what I want remember he told me he said I've never done that before he said I've never done that operation I said well can you learn I'm going to be the first and he did I was the very first very very seasoned doctor very very good doctor as a matter of fact that he's the ortho, uh, orthopedic surgeon for some of our professional teams here in in Houston and he did that why because you know what God wants to bring the very best so God sent his son to reconcile us man was on one side God was on the other and Jesus mended us together and that's the word for peace he's the prince of peace he's the prince of healing he brings all things back together and you know what a mother sees a mother sees the best in you even when you fail a mother still sees the best in you that's why you don't have to be ashamed in front of your mother you don't have to be afraid in front of your mother even if you don't feel like you're successful you can come in front of your mother and you can tell her your problems because she's going to accept you and love you and a mother always sees the best in you even if you fail that's why I've learned this in Angola prison it's amazing how many men have done heinous heinous crimes I don't mean just kill people the way they killed them but guess who still comes mama comes brother and sister don't come friends don't come I mean Ann can vouch for this Hillary can vouch for how many times how many times I've heard the phrase pastor when you go to prison that's when you find out who your real friends are I don't have any friends they don't come and see me but my mama comes as a matter of fact in prisons everywhere Mother's Day is the largest day in prison that is celebrated with the most cards going out of prison you know Mother's Day I don't know about today is generally the biggest day for restaurants in America because everybody goes out to eat I don't know how y'all are gonna do that today I'm going home to cook today my kids are coming over I'm cooking uh, yesterday I planted flowers for Ann my wife loves flowers I planted flowers everywhere <laughs> If there was empty ground, I'd put a flower in it. And so we got flowers everywhere, and we got some left over even. So we got plenty of flowers. But you know what? Moms are so special in that. And the way a mom sees us is so amazing. Can we put that illustration up? You know, God always sees us in the Spirit, and He sees who and what we are. And when you look at this, what do you see? God doesn't just see an egg. He sees a chicken in the egg because he made your end before he made your beginning how many of you know that moms have hope for you for all of their kids they have hope when they look at them they don't see them as the the this or the that or the something else or they see them for what God's purpose and what God's plan is that's what God sees in you he's looking and you know when man fell out of favor or came into sin God reconciled us through his son and that's really a lot like mom and Jesus mom and Jesus I'm gonna tell you with a mom and a Jesus you can make it amen with a Jesus you can make it but oh how many of us our mom helped us to find Jesus how important was that I'm gonna tell you my wife she had Bible study with our kids every morning they began that way they read the Word of God it was so amazing because that's a mother's heart that's just a part of what's in a mom and I'm gonna encourage every one of you moms it's never too late no matter how old your children are it is never too late to share Jesus with them it's never too late to love them that way well one day Jesus was teaching he was teaching some great things how many of you know moms are great teachers 
One day Jesus was teaching, he talked about the sower and how the sower sowed the word and he sowed the word in these different environments. You know, some didn't grow, but some went on the good ground and the good ground caused it to grow. That's the importance of environment. We need to teach our kids about environment. You are a seed, but you have authority over that seed and the environment that it's going to be placed in. It can be a good seed and bad environment. It causes no growth. You've got to find the good soil. And he's talking about the sower and how he sowed the different kinds of seed. And then he said, unto you is given to know the mystery. He said, I'm teaching in parables because they seeing they don't see and hearing they don't hear. But unto you it's going to be given. And Jesus would expound on the parables that he had taught unto the people. And then he talked about a candle and said, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel? No, it's brought to give light. It's brought to be on a candle stand. How many of you know the word of God is the light in this world? And we need to put it up high. We need to lift it up high. Jesus said if he was lifted up, that he would draw all men unto himself. And Jesus said, take heed what you hear. Isn't that important? Take heed what you hear. With what you hear, it's going to be met back to you. In other words, according to what you hear, it's going to be according to what you have. And to be careful about that. He said the kingdom of God is like a seed that is sown. He said we plant a seed and we know not how, but it rises and it grows, and yet we don't know how. Of such, he said, is the kingdom of God. And then he said, the kingdom of God is also likened unto a mustard seed. That when it is planted, it's one of the smallest seeds of all. How many of you know, mamas, that have believed in us? Oliva, she, she has Mikey and, and the doctors, the, the, the school people, the, the, the psychologists. They, they said he needs to be in special classes. Oh no, not my Mikey, no. He's going to make it. I want you to know today, Mikey's in high school and he's in the National Honor Society. Why? Because a mama believed. Mamas don't give up. Mamas don't quit. Branson has got a mama that believes, a mama that trusts, a mama that prays. Jesus said the kingdom is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds. Now, I'm not talking about American mustard seed. I love mustard greens, but I'm talking about seeds so small that you have to cover your mouth because if you breathe, they'll scatter everywhere. And yet Jesus said it becomes one of the greatest of herbs that the birds come and lodge in its nest. Of such is the kingdom of God. And then where I pick up on Mark 4 verse 35, and the same day. Now that was some good teaching for a day, wasn't it? On the same day, Jesus has poured all this out, explained it's getting later in the evening. And on the same day, when the even was come, he said unto them, he said, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, you know, people followed Jesus. Now, Jesus acknowledged they weren't all believers. Some of them just wanted to be fed. Some of them just wanted to be healed. They weren't all believers, but they followed Jesus wherever he went. And it says that, that when they sent the multitude away, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also other little ships that were following him. How many of you know you got a following when people are following you all on the land and when they get in little ships to follow you when you leave and push off of the land? There were even little ships gathered around Jesus. Now this is the last we hear of the little ships. Verse 37 says, There arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship. I said, we don't hear about those other ships anymore. I'm, I'm presuming. This is just me presuming. I could be totally wrong. I think they turned back and went to the land. I think when the storm came, they said, well, you know, Jesus is awesome, but I'm going back to the port. I'm going back to safety. The storm, the wind... And the waves beat into the ship so that the ship was now full. Water was coming in. And he, Jesus, was in the hinder part, the rear part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and they said unto him, Master. Now this is so, this is so awesome. Do you care that we're about to die? Master, wake up. Don't you care? This is what it says, King James Version. Carest thou that, not that we perish, and he arose. I love that. What did Jesus do? He arose. 
How many of you know he's fixing to open up a can? You know what I'm talking about? He arose. Jesus is fixing to do something. Amen? He arose. He arose from the dead and he did something. He arose. I love this wording. He arose. All of a sudden, Jesus arose and what he did is he rebuked the wind and he said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, I'm not even going to preach on any of that. This is just part of the story. And they feared exceedingly, and they said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the seas do obey him? Obviously, they didn't really know Jesus really, really well. They thought they did, but they didn't know him that well. Do you care, Lord, that we're about to die? Let me ask you, could you imagine asking your mother that question? Mom, don't you care? I'm dying. I mean, I wouldn't ask my mom that question. Of course my mom cares. There's the, but what about going a step further? Ask Jesus. Jesus, what's the deal? Come on, man, don't you care? I'm fixing to die. We're all going to die. I don't know if you're going to die, but we're going to die. And Jesus, where is he? He's in the boat, but he's asleep. How many of you realize that Jesus didn't really have any cares? You understand he wasn't burdened? with those cares he wasn't burdened with that storm you know I know that that COVID whatever you want to call it it's certainly a storm but he, he didn't seem to be too worried about that storm at the moment and they didn't really know him and so he arose and I'm glad that he arose and words are important you know your words are important what you listen to what you hear is going to be met back to you words are very important what you're listening to what you're saying Jesus is the word of God that's why we should always take it to the word what is our time what is our situation what does the word say about it because the word always has something to say but Jesus notice he said two things how many of you realize that with the word of God and the power behind that word, you don't have to say a lot? How many of you know the Bible says there's power in just the name Jesus? Hmm? I'm going to tell you, while you're having that car wreck and you're flipping end over end and you don't have time to go into 30 minutes of prayer, just say, Jesus! Because there's power. There's power in that name. There's power in that word. And although Jesus was a common name, God said, I'm going to take that name and I'm going to make that name above every name. Jesus, the living God. There's power in that name. But you know, some people, when they read this, they think that he's just talking to the wind and he's talking to the sea. But that's wrong. He's not just talking to the wind. He's not just talking to the sea. I want to show you something here. I want you to see this. We've been talking about peace. Peace comes from the word irene. It's used 111 times in Scripture. Peace, irene, means to reconcile. Do you think he was trying to tell that storm to get stronger? No. No. He didn't use that word, Irene. You know, Irene means to heal something and make it strong. Jesus wasn't saying, oh, storm, heal yourself and get stronger. That's not what he was saying. Peace, the word Irene is not, not used here. Saapa is used here. And the word Saapa means to be free of noise or uproar. To be free of noise or uproar. Jesus was not speaking to the sea he was speaking to the disciples. He wasn't saying peace to the storm. He did speak to the storm. He told the storm to be still. And it was silent. How many of you realize that sometimes Jesus can be in our boat, but we still struggle? Jesus can be in our boat, but we really don't have peace. He wasn't blessing or increasing the storm. They were struggling in the boat. They said, Lord, do you even care? We're dying. We are going to die in this situation. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. They were struggling. Maybe they were still learning. Maybe, how many of you are still learning in the struggles of life? I mean, you haven't failed, but you're still learning. We're all learning. Peace was meant for the storm in his disciples, not the storm that was on the sea. 
How many of you today will admit and recognize that sometimes there are storms in the world and sometimes those storms get invited into your heart? That it wasn't just the storm on the sea. Because I'm going to tell you, Jesus was not concerned about the storm on the sea. When he spoke peace, he was speaking to his disciples. He is the prince of peace. He is the reconciler. When he said be still, he meant that for the storm. Jesus really doesn't command us to be still. Did you understand that? Jesus, let me say it again. Jesus never commands you to be still. Why? He always gives you a choice. He always gives you a choice. It's a choice to serve him. It's a choice to love him. It's a choice to let peace come into our heart. It's a choice. Peace is what is a choice he gives to us. Peace is the choice that he's offering to the church. Peace is the choice that he's offering to you. Peace doesn't depend upon the storm. He'll give you peace before the storm. He'll give you peace during the storm. He'll give you peace after the storm. But it has to be a choice that we have to play a role in that peace. We have to accept. We have to receive. And so the first piece, Irene, is for reconciliation. The second piece, Siapa, which is only used 12 times. Remember, Irene is used 111 times in Scripture. This word is not used very often. Usually when this word is used, it's in reference to holding your peace. Holding it. He uses this word, which means the stillness in your heart. Have you ever had your heart troubled before? I mean, isn't there a passage of Scripture that goes something like this? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe in me also, for I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus, where is he? He's in the boat. I'm going to tell you, he promises to never leave us. He promises to never forsake us. How many of you know, that's a lot like moms, huh? My mom wasn't very big, but my mom would fight anybody if it came to me. She would fight in. She didn't look at size. She didn't care how big you were. My mama was feisty. And of course, she was a fighter because she'd been passed around so much. She was just, you know, she's scrappy. My mom's still scrappy. She's little, but she's scrappy. She weighs 100 pounds. But she told us the other day, Ann and I were there. She said, you know, I'm tough. I said, you are tough. My mama's tough. She's a tough woman. She broke both of her hips, never complained, never had any pain, fell, hit her head, had to have like 12 staples put in it, never complained, doesn't hurt. She said, I'm tough. She is. My mama, she's tough. But she has a lot of peace in her heart. God gives us peace and God gives us the choice. And Jesus always honors our choice. Do you know Jesus would have honored the disciples if they never would have wakened him in the storm? But I want to show you the strength of our God. The strength. Don't look at and think that Jesus was forgetting his disciples. Don't look at it and think he was abusing his disciples. It just wasn't his concern. How many of you know we have a big enough, you know, load trying to take care of our own concerns and to, you know, be concerned for every little detail that he's just like asleep in the boat? But when they woke him, you know, Jesus talks about being the good shepherd. And as the good shepherd, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He said, the hireling will see the storm come and he'll leave. He said, but I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. This is leave you. I will never. The promise that he makes to each and every one of us because he loves us. He loves you. And during this COVID, I I want you to hear peace. Peace be still. Peace to the storm. Because I believe God is growing us. I believe God is doing something good. But you know what we have to do is we have to come to that place. And now I'm going to come back to this verse. I'm going to close with this. We have to to trust him we have to trust him we have to show love what kind of love the love that covers a multitude of sins we have to be fervent in that love during this time during COVID of course we opened our doors to to people to come back this Sunday and I'm so glad to see so many people here and we want to each and every week we want to love people through the storm 
We want to know Jesus is in the boat. He's with us. And he's speaking not just to the storm on the outside of us. He's speaking to whatever it is, whatever it may be, whatever your condition, but whatever the storm is that you might have going on in your life. And of course, people can have storms right now because they're concerned about their jobs. They're concerned, are they going to keep their job? Are they going to be furloughed? Are they going to be laid off? They're concerned that they're going to get a pay cut, that their salary is going to go down. They're concerned that they might catch the virus. They're concerned for this or that, or concerned for someone else. There's so many concerns, but I want you to realize, I want you to know today that Jesus is asleep in your boat. He's asleep in your boat. He's got a pillow underneath his head. Now, I want you to notice this, that very rarely, we hardly ever, ever, ever in Scripture hear about Jesus sleeping. We hear about him being up all night praying. Very rarely. It's almost like Jesus doesn't sleep. Now, I know he was a man just like you and I. The Scripture says our Father doesn't slumber. God doesn't sleep. But you see, Jesus came as a man. And as a man, I want you and I to realize this, as a man, there is a peace that comes to you that allows you to lay your head down at night and go to sleep. Not worried about what tomorrow may bring. Knowing there is a rescue, there is a source, there is a supply. There is a man named Jesus who came and took our place. And he battled with all of our concerns. And even the winds and the sea obeyed him. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Proverbs 3 verse 5. Trust in him with all of your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. One translation says, and he will make your path straight. He will go before you. Now I know there were times in my life where I depended on my mom to make my path straight. There were times in my life that I knew I couldn't fix this. It was beyond my power. But I knew I could go to mom and mom could fix it. When I was in second grade, I haven't told this story in forever. When I was in second grade, I almost died in the cafeteria. We were having a hot dog eating contest. Not inspired by the school, inspired by my friends and I to see who could eat their hot dog the fastest. Well, I had just come back from the Houston Zoo. My mom took me to the zoo. And I don't know if it's still like this today, but when used to, when you walked in the zoo, the very first thing in front of you was the seals. You know, they were swimming and jumping in the water and had that thing they'd climb up on. Today, that I happened to be just perfect timing, they were feeding the seals. And what was so amazing is these seals could take a whole fish and swallow it with one bite. They'd grab it by the head and their old head would go up and that old tail and then, whoop, thing's gone. And I thought, well, why can't I do a hot dog the same way? I'll swallow this whole hot dog in one bite. Can't do that. That doesn't work. I didn't know that, but I got the hot dog down far enough that when I opened up my mouth, the teachers could see the hot dog. They just couldn't get it out. And I was dying. I went up to my teacher, and she sent me back to my seat. I went up to her, I didn't have any air, so I couldn't talk, so no words could come out. She said, Rusty, you go sit down. I'm like, I don't think that would be the right thing to do. And when I started turning colors, she realized I was choking. She grabbed me and she started trying to do anything and everything that she could do. There was one nurse, that was, one teacher that was an RN, she was a nurse. And my friends still love to hear this story. We still tell this story when I get together. They did everything they could. They squeezed me. They heimlicked me. They stuck their hands down my mouth. They did everything they could do. Finally, uh, one teacher would grab this arm. Another teacher would grab this one. One grabbed this leg. One grabbed... And they started doing me up and down like a carpet. 
and every time I would come up in the air, the biggest teacher would hit me in the back. And so I, poor kids thought they were just beating the, the, you know, the stuffings out of me. They didn't realize I was dying. And the teachers all gave up. Every one of them gave up. The ambulance had been called, but of course I wouldn't have made it till the ambulance got there. My mom was going to pick up freight for us. My parents owned an industrial hardware store and she was on her way to Pearland, Texas to pick up freight that day. And remember, we're talking about the days where we didn't have no cell phones. Y'all really, there weren't no cell phones back then. And my mom was driving to Pearland and the Holy Ghost spoke to her. How many of you believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you? The Holy Ghost spoke to my mom and said, you need to pray for Rusty. And she turned her car around and she had a black Grand Prix. I still remember that Grand Prix. It was fast. And she started going as fast as she could with her flashers on to the school. You know that one nurse, that one RN, she didn't give up. You know what she literally did? Of course, I, I passed out. I was unconscious. I think that when I was unconscious, maybe my mouth, my jaw relaxed a little bit. And she was able to get her big hand down in my second grade mouth and get a hold of that weenie and pull that weenie out. I'll never forget, it wasn't just a matter of minutes that my mama got there. She pulled right up to the principal's office, jumped out of her car, lights still flashing, came running in, where's Rusty, where's Rusty? And of course they're like, uh, um, we called the ambulance. The ambulance is on its way. I remember coming to, coming out of my, my, I was passed out and I was all the way up against the wall in the cafeteria and all the children were just like staring. I mean, it was quieter than a mouse in there. And when I woke up, that hot dog was about six inches from my nose, laying on the ground in front of me. But I was alive and my mama was there. Sometimes God can do things for us that we can't do for ourselves. Sometimes our moms can pray for us when we can't pray for ourselves. I'm going to be real honest. Prayer was not on my mind while I was choking. I never, I, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed and ashamed of this. When I was in the fire, when I was in all of the other accidents, I called to the Lord. I didn't call. Why? I was a second grader. I don't know. I, I knew better, but I just didn't call. I was dying. But my mama... She was praying. Let me tell you, the scripture says when you go through times like that, that the Holy Spirit himself, when we know not what to pray as we ought, the Spirit itself prays through us with moanings, with groanings, with sounds, with noises that cannot be understood. My mama was praying in the Spirit. And I want you to know today that Jesus is in your boat and all we have to do is wake him up. Wake him up. He's never leaving you. He's never forsaking you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, if he's not Lord in your life, I want you to know he has a good plan for you. He knew you before he formed you. He knows about every storm. He's not going to miss a storm. He knows where your life is. He has a plan and a purpose for everybody that's watching, as well as every one of you who are here today. Now, I, I would imagine that most of you here, you already know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if there's even one here in this building, if there's one, and I know there's more than one watching, that today is your call. It's your call. Jesus is in your boat. Today is the day you give your life and your purpose over to him because he has good plans for you. The devil wants to mark out your plans. He wants to rid you of that life. He wants to cause storms in your life. But even though there are storms, we can be confident. Another time on a great storm, Jesus came out walking on the water. He came to them in the boat. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. If you want to receive Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, it's simple. All you have to do is ask him to come. Is there anybody here in the building they will say, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus today as my Lord and Savior. I'm not quite sure. I don't know exactly what, what would happen with my life, and I want to receive him today. If that's you, just raise your hand. If that's you watching today, we want you to acknowledge. We have a gift for you. We want to bless you. But we need to know today that Jesus is for us. We celebrate Mother's Day. What a happy day. What a great day. I appreciate my mom very, very much. I couldn't be where I am today without her. I do all of this because of her. Because of great love that she had for me. 
And the Father God loves us even more. I love you. If you want to receive the Lord, we're going to give you some instructions. For the rest of you that are here today, we're going to pray. Let's pray right now before we're dismissed. Let's pray out loud together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Son, Jesus, who is with me in every storm. And today I call upon Jesus. I call upon the name above all names. And I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to heal me of my fear, take me out of the waves of the storm, protect me and keep me, for you have great plans for me, and I honor your plans, and I honor you by giving my life to you today. Father, I receive your son. I'm a child of God, and I am a peacemaker. Make your peace in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.